Larry Philip Fontaine is arguably one of the most influential Aboriginal leaders in Canadian history. As the longest serving leader of the Assembly of First Nations, Fontaine has been instrumental in shedding light on and bringing some justice to key issues facing First Nations. Recent years have seen the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, historic settlements, and breakthrough legal land claim rulings. I asked Fontaine how he thinks Canada's First Nations are faring today. We're doing much better. We're more politically involved. We have, in the Northwest Territories, the Premier is uh, Indigenous. In Manitoba, we had uh, Eric Robinson was Deputy Premier. We have uh, Indigenous people that are uh, in the uh, uh, Liberal Cabinet. Uh, we, and we, the Justice Minister is uh, uh, Indigenous, Judy Wilson-Raybould. So politically, we're, we're in, in much better shape at least in mainstream politics. Uh, in terms of education, the numbers are, have improved significantly uh, in terms of producing graduates and then having those graduates assume influential positions in, in the different disciplines. Uh, and so we have, the professional class is growing. The flip side, of course, is that uh, our community, the indigenous community, is still the most impoverished in Canada. And that is in, unacceptable, because Canada is one of the richest countries in the world. And we're talking here of 2017. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, is, what is in our favor now that wasn't always the case was, of course, the courts have become uh, more, more favorable in terms of rendering decisions that are, that are good and uh, in terms of for example, the duty to consult, which, which is a legal duty on, on governments, the duty to accommodate reconciliation, the most recent Supreme Court uh, decision on Chilkoot and the title case in British Columbia. So th the courts have been more understanding and uh, in fact have been uh, uh, pretty proactive and supportive of the indigenous position when it comes to the law. And so that has created uh, a climate where uh, developers, resource, the resource sector, know now that the game, the rules of the game have changed. When it comes to poverty, no Canadian can feel good about the state of First Nations, about the state of reserves, and yet we don't seem to be able to move the dial much on it. Uh, you know, including, you know, in your time of your leadership, in times when governments were spending less, in times when they're spending more. What are we getting wrong here? Well, the problem is that uh, out of sight, out of mind. Um, and uh, Canadians don't have an appreciation of uh, the, uh, the talent in uh, our community. And... Uh, uh, have not informed themselves that there are tremendous success stories in our community. And uh, when it comes to the issue of poverty and all of its ugly manifestations, water problems, mm -hmm. uh, children in care, uh, disproportionate in incarceration rates and uh, uh, terrible housing situation, TB on the rise in our communities, well, um, they don't uh, think about what that means for their own interests. And, uh, and so there has been, I believe, uh, the fact that we are not seen in the proper light. Uh, the, that fact has led to a situation where Canadians um, don't feel compelled to force their governments whether we're talking about the federal government or provincial and territorial governments, to do right uh, by all of its peoples, but particularly indigenous peoples, as we uh, represent uh, uh, an integral part of Canada, its past and indeed its future. And we don't feel compelled because of systemic 
bias, racism? Oh, I, I think it's quite in order to say that we have racism in Canada. The, the poverty that you and I are just talking about is a direct consequence of uh, racism, uh, racist uh, policy uh, from all levels of government. And uh, the fact that you couple that with the fact that Canadians simply aren't aware of their history. And, uh, and as a result, they haven't educated and informed themselves about uh, Indigenous peoples and their place in Canada and why Canada would actually be better off if the country could come to grips with Indigenous poverty and, and coming together in terms of fixing this because it's entirely fixable. Is it fixable in the context of the reserve system? Are all reserves viable? Or are some of them actually not viable? Well, the fact is, uh, reserves were, were created by, by government. And it so happens that that is all we have left. And so we guard jealously uh, reserves, our, our lands, because we occupy and possess now less than one half of 1% of the entire landmass of Canada. And uh, that is represented by reserves and the reserve system. The reserves, the res reserves and the reserve system would um, be okay if you had the wherewithal to be self-sustaining, to be independent, to have governments recognize uh, our rights and interests in a way that uh, we can actually exercise those rights in the same way that other uh, governments do in, in Canada. And uh, we forget, you see, that when it comes to Canada's wealth, it's largely in the ground. And it so happens that that wealth is on our lands, particularly in northern communities, whether we're talking about oil and gas, mining, hydro development, forestry. We're talking about our people. And as you point out, that BC Supreme Court decision is a bit of a game changer. Oh, well, uh, decisions such as that one and, and other Supreme Court uh, decisions that relate to the duty to consult, duty to accommodate, and, uh, and uh, reconciliation. We were reminded the other night at a forum that I attended that uh, the courts have been actually quite uh, progressive in terms of understanding, knowing and understanding our history. And as a result, the decisions that have been coming from the courts have been uh, more uh, uh, progressive, more liberal, uh, and, uh, and that's helpful. And it will be very helpful in the long run. Where does it take us? Where does it take your people? Well, um, if you look at once again, the courts, very empowering. Reason, the resource sector is developing an awareness and understanding that, as I said, that the rules of the game have, have changed and business is going to have to be done differently. Differently means the full engagement of our people in our communities and uh, the language as a result has changed. Right? Now our people are talking about partnerships, are talking about equity, talking about joint ventures. They're not just talking about jobs and training. They're talking about much more. And uh, all of that much more is entirely possible. And, and if we can achieve success in that regard, talk about a game changer. Our, our, it would transform our communities and in turn transform the country into being the place that it presented itself as in for, for the longest time. And we've known that that story wasn't entirely true. As a political leader, Phil Fontaine often acted as a bridge to business and government. Recent court rulings have newly empowered First Nations and forced businesses to consider working with rather than around First Nations. And that is a change for the better. Can we sustain that notion of better? It really is dependent on, on 
the private sector. It certainly depends on us uh, reaching out in, in a more proactive uh, way with the private sector. It's about governments uh, bringing forward good policy that will enable rather than prohi prohibit our, our communities from being fully engaged in every aspect of uh, Canadian life, whether we're talking about the, the economy or the education system or the ch child welfare system or just, you know, doing something about water and, uh, and, and housing as, uh, as just two examples about that. But for the business community, the learning curve has been short and steep. Uh, and it's interesting to look at some of the oversight that went on before some of these recent changes. Are they, are they where they need to be? Do they understand just what the duty to consult is going to mean? You talk about a steep learning curve. Th that's true for government, true for the private sector, resource companies, true for us. And so it's really, we're talking about co a more collaborative approach. Um, and for example, when you talk about nation to nation, that's re we're really talking about collaborative consent where our community is engaged in, in drafting laws and figuring out what laws are, are needed, what policy is needed, uh, and to ensure that, uh, that the definition of nation to nation includes the, this notion of collaboration, collaborative uh, approach to, uh, to not just uh, the way we uh, run the country in terms of, of government, but most particularly when we talk about uh, business development. From the point of view of First Nations, uh, one of the great strengths of the AFN is it, the unifying factor, speaking with one voice. Uh, when that doesn't happen, is that a problem? Well, we shouldn't overlook one important uh, uh, fact here is that we're an incredibly diverse community 633 first nation communities in every part of the country uh, we speak what is it 58 uh, languages uh, our cultures are different our our traditions are different and uh, this diversity quite often represents some real challenges to making sure that afn the in this case the assembly of first nations is is able to represent the, the different points of view and perspectives in a way that makes sense to, to all. And uh, to expect that the every, AFN will get things right every time is a bit much, right? Uh, I think uh, that's uh, an unfair expectation in the same way that we don't expect the, the government in Ottawa or provincial governments to, to get it right every time. Uh, we don't. And so uh, I think that's a, a, a good starting point to uh, start looking at things differently. And uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting challenge, one that uh, didn't uh, um, cause me to, to lose faith or to be less optimistic. I, I, I always was, and I, I remain optimistic that things will be better. And, if, and, and in fact, they are getting better. But at a good pace, no. We have to do better, uh, uh, more aggressively. We sometimes look back on uh, turning points. Was the, the Kelowna Accord and then its failure to be implemented a turning point in our history? Well, there, there are a number of major events as far as we're concerned. 1982, Constitution, the recognition of ex existing uh, Aboriginal treaty rights, uh, the uh, Royal, the Meech Lake, the collapse of the Meech Lake Accord, uh, Elijah Harper's courageous uh, stand, uh, the creation of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples and its outstanding work, 440 recommendations that uh, at that time represented uh, a roadmap to, roadmap to Canada's future, and then the emergence of the residential school experience as, as very important issue in Canada and uh, important because Canadians generally were not aware that residential schools existed and if they did didn't know what they were about and residential schools came about through a racist 
discriminatory assimilationist policy, bad policy, and uh, it, it was around far too long, right? The Indian Act in, 18, uh, in 1876, Confederation, the, the table that created this federation, Aboriginal people, Indigenous people were absent. And so those were all important moments in, in our history. Now we have TRC uh, and the report with 94 calls to action. And of course, before then, you referred to Kelowna. That was just uh, so very important. It was a missed opportunity. And uh, it was a missed opportunity because it was about closing the gap in, in terms of, of the quality of life, in terms of, in terms of housing, education, health, and economic development. But one thing we have that we were able to build on is that this, uh, uh, well, I can call it, I suppose, a threshold moment, because now uh, we have something even more substantial than that. Remember, during the campaign, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau in, in Whitehorse said, we will implement Kelowna Plus. So the reference there is Kelowna. So we may have lost its implementation at that moment, but it's, uh, it's re-emerged in, in uh, bigger uh, and, and more expansive uh, terms. Phil Fontaine was instrumental in unveiling the truth about what happened to children in residential schools. While he went on to success, his own experience in that system was one he had to fight to overcome. I, uh, I suffered uh, the, the consequences for years and years. And, I, and uh, you never get over it completely. And uh, in my own case, I was blessed with opportunities. I was at the right place at the right time. And uh, I emerged as I did, not because I was uh, more intelligent or more skilled or more talented than a lot of the, my peers that, that uh, missed out. Uh, it was just the circumstances were, were different. And uh, I'm just very thankful that, uh, that uh, I'm here and, and in the shape I am. I'm not a whole person necessarily, but far better shape than I was uh, uh, back in the day, and uh, so I, 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 um, I believe that uh, that it should never, whatever action is taken by governments, for example, should be it should never be because of one person or about one person. It should be the preoccupation, the obsession should be about the community, and uh, I mean. You talk about children, for example. There are 30,000 children, First Nation children in state care. Three times the number of children that were in residential school at the height of the residential school experience. That's a, that's a tragic, tragic situation. And we shouldn't be fighting about money. Government should pay, pay the price, and should do it in, in good faith and the sense of... Uh, of uh, a, belief, a belief in the well-being of all peoples, including our children. Are you optimistic about the future? I am for a whole number of reasons, and I've, I've, I've referenced uh, some of those reasons. Court, uh, the courts that have become more favorable to, to our rights and interests, uh, the fact that we're better educated, that we're more politically aware. Uh, my, my greatest... Uh, the greatest sense of optimism I have, and I've had that for some time, is the opportunities that uh, the private sector uh, offers us. Because with, without question, our, our people, our communities, are tired of being dependent on government. We, we want to be independent. We want our own uh, self-sustaining economies. We want the revitalization of our economies. We want to we want to be able to control our own destiny, and we're only going to be able to do that uh, by taking full advantage of, for example, we talked about the wealth in our communities. And the most effective way of doing that, of course, is a collaborative approach with the private sector, governments, and, and our own people. So I'm optimistic for those reasons, and uh, 
I'm involved in some pretty, pretty uh, cutting edge uh, uh, business, businesses, including uh, my involvement in, most recently in medical uh, marijuana. What is that opportunity? What do you see there? Well, it's an emerging market, uh, and uh, it has terrific potential. And uh, I recognized for some time that in, in terms of quality product and quality service, that uh, our community was underserved. And so I saw an opportunity not only, not only to create wealth, uh, not only to build capacity, uh, jobs and training, but really, most importantly, is to ensure that there is safe, uh, reliable uh, access to uh, something that is good for the health of our, of our communities. And uh, we, uh, we lucked into uh, uh, entering into a partnership with uh, the first licensed producer in Canada, now known as, as Kronos, uh, with great depth in, in, um, in the business, uh, highly skilled people, and their interests aligned with, with our Ours. They they believed in the same things that we did, and so it was it wasn't difficult to create uh, a partnership. Uh, now we have a, a company, Indigenous Roots, that's First Nations owned, and uh, Kronos is our partner, and it has all kinds of wonderful uh, possibilities. Whether it's uh, the law, or consulting on pipelines, consulting in the financial services industry, you. You do a lot. Uh, how do you choose where you're going to put your energy? Well, if I look back in, in my in, in time, I mean, I've been involved now for 40 years in uh, the public sector. And when I decided to retire uh, close to eight years ago and made a decision to go to the private sector, join the corporate worlds, so to speak. Um, I was of the view, and I still am today, that it was a continuation of what I believed in for, for the longest time, mm -hmm. which is independent, self-sustaining communities, First Nation communities, a healthy, vibrant First Nation community. And, uh, and when I look back and I think about uh, the corporate challenge that we, uh, uh, we initiated, which was built on four pillars, uh, procurement, partnerships, investment, and employment. And we had some good partners that, that joined uh, our efforts to transform our communities. And so my exp that experience convinced me that there was an opportunity here. And then, lo and behold, the, the courts came forward with some tremendously uh, progressive decisions. And so the table has been set for us. And uh, now it's on our shoulders to take full advantage of those opportunities and in the process convince the private sector that what we represent is an opportunity for them. And we recognize that the private sector is about certainty. So are we. We know certainty, uh, uncertainty uh, is a, you know, there's a cost to uncertainty. There's a price. And uh, we recognize that. And so we want the corporate world to have a better appreciation of our, of our interest and our intent to, uh, to work in a collaborative way with, uh, with the private sector. All right. We've got to leave it there. We appreciate your time today. Thank you.